So thank you, Dave, for the introduction. Dear colleagues, I would like to show you our concept on how we treat different types of defects in reconstructive prontosurgery. surgery. And I would like to address the following topics in the next 25 minutes. Our treatment goals, then I would like to provide you a short overview about the materials that may promote peronta regeneration based on histologic evidence, and then to show you our treatment strategy in intraboni defects, in furcations, and in recessions, and finally to go over and uh, to point out some new developments. So which are our treatment goals? Clinically, we would like to reduce deep pockets. That means we should have pockets less than four millimeters after our treatment, and to gain clinical attachment by minimizing, in the same time, soft tissue recession. We would like to eliminate intraboni or angular defects and vulcation defects, but not via a resective approach, but by regenerating, if possible, the lost peronta structures. Why? In order to facilitate plaque control, to gain more tooth support, and of course, the final goal is to improve long-term tooth prognosis. So for example, if you have a case like this one that was a patient referred to me with a 50 millimeters deep pocket, I would like that after regenerative therapy, the case should look like this one. So around 8 millimeter attachment gain and around 7 millimeter bone gain. What about a class 2 furcation? If we have a case like this one, as you can observe it here, I would like to have a stable situation at four years. What about recession type defects? We would like, first of all, to allow our patients to clean this area, to obtain complete root coverage. But not only root coverage, we would also like to enhance peronteal regeneration and to obtain an optimal tissue blending and color by avoiding, in the same time, scar tissue formation. So look at this case. If the patient presents with this defect, which is quite challenging, I would like to end up with this situation. So which materials may promote regeneration? And what is the goal of regeneration? Histologically, as you can observe in this slide, we should have, sorry, we should have new cementum, peronta ligament, and bone coronally to the notch indicating the most apical part of the defect, which means that we have uh, regenerated the lost attachment on an avascular and plaque-infected root surface. So we recently published uh, an important article in Perontology 2000 where we have overviewed all the papers, all the human histological papers evaluating the regeneration based on histologic evidence. And I would like to point out some important conclusions. So what about bone grafting materials? In humans, peronta regeneration was demonstrated with autogenous bone, with allografts, and with certain types of bovine xenografts. However, we were not very positive regarding alloplastic materials since until now they have not been shown to promote regeneration. What about guided tissue regeneration with different types of membranes? We have evidence that guided tissue regeneration promotes peronteal regeneration in humans. And you can see some of the important literature. However, technically, this is a sensitive procedure because we can have a risk for complications. And another problem is that in non-contained defects, the membrane may collapse into the defect, and we have then limited space for the regeneration process. This is one example of one of our studies published some years ago. And you can observe that on this root surface, we have newly formed cementum, peronta ligament, and bone 
that you can observe at a high magnification to the right, indicating that only with the membrane, if the GTR functions, we can have uh, perfect regeneration. And in this case, it was more than 4.5 millimeters histologically. What about in MMX proteins? We have some data from the 70s showing that the deposition of the enamel matrix onto the developing root surfaces is a crucial step for cementum formation. And cementum, periodontal ligament, and alveolar bone proper are linked together. So if you go now to the literature on enamel proteins, you will find more than 150 publications only related to the in vitro data. And what we can say nowadays that we have a kind of growth factor-like material in our hands, which may increase the attachment rate and migration of PDL cells towards the root surface. It may inhibit or retard epithelial proliferation. And in combination with certain grafting material, we may have more bone. And an interesting effect is also on the cells originating from the gingiva connective tissue, which may proliferate better. Very important finding that we published last year is that uh, enamel proteins work or act via the TGF beta kinase. That means we have a kind of growth factor like activity which enhances our outcomes. So, summarizing the current evidence, we can say that enamel proteins promote parental regeneration in humans. However, technically, it's still a sensitive procedure because uh, we need to perform a proper surgery, but it's lower than with the GTR. However, in non content defects, again, the flap may collapse because the material doesn't have enough stability. Histologically, you can see on this slide we have, again, a comparable outcome than with the GTR membrane because we have cementum, parental ligament, and bone formation that you can see at a high magnification to the right. Look at the clinical case that was treated by myself in 97. And this is a huge bone defect. And this is the outcome at four years, only by using enamel proteins. And this is five millimeters of newly formed bone. What is now better? A membrane or enamel proteins? And we can say nowadays that there's no difference in terms of histological or clinical outcome. And here are some findings from randomized controlled clinical studies. In two and three wall defects, we can say is more or less the same, as you can observe it here. However, if you look at the last line, this is a randomized controlled study where we have compared the outcomes in one wall non contained defect. And this is one example of this study. You see the one wall defect with a non contained anatomy treated with an MMX proteins, and the outcome is nice, but we have some recession. However, if we look at the case treated with a titanium reinforced membrane, we had less recessions, indicating that we have a higher chance to gain at least four and five millimeters in a case where we can maintain the flap. And this is very important. So, now, the next point is why to combine different materials? Because the defect anatomy plays a very important role. So first, rational is to enhance parental regeneration by using an MMX proteins, growth factors, or membranes. And in the same time, to provide the space and to stabilize the space by using an appropriate grafting material. And we have different studies. And if you look at the literature, you can find out that if we combine enamel proteins, for example, with autogenous bone, DFTPA, or some xenogenic materials, the outcomes are better. However, synthetic materials did not seem to perform as good. So this research is very important, and it is still going on, but indicates that natural materials may function better. And this is one example of a combination of enamel proteins and natural bone mineral, which resulted again in cementum 
peronta ligament formation and bone formation around the grafting particles. So can enamimatics proteins replace a membrane? And we performed a study where we had two groups. And one group was treated with enamimatics proteins and the graft, and the other group was treated with a graft and covered with a membrane. And if you look at the results, is no difference. So in fact, we can use both of them. And this is one example. You see the clinical images. Here we have an intrabony defect, one wall defect, non-contained anatomy, treated with a combination of enamimatics proteins and the mixture of enamimatics proteins and the graft. And here we have the outcome at the right, indicating a quite nice feel of the defect and gain of clinical attachment. If we look at the second group, as you can see it here, treated with a graft and a membrane, the outcome is also nice. So comparable to the combination in emimatics proteins and graft. So in other words, we can use both of them. So what is now our treatment strategy, dear colleagues, in intrabony defects? So we have contained and non-contained time defects. And if we look at the contained time defects, a three-wall defect, we have the better chances to regenerate. However, the problem is always in non-contained defects, one-wall defects. And let me show you our decision tree. We first, of course, treat non-surgically the patient. And then when we go to surgery, we have to have a perfect plaque control. This I assume that is done. We need to raise the flap to characterize the anatomy of the defect. And then when we have the intrabony component in front of us, we may have a narrow and contained defect. We use in those cases in amniotics proteins. If you have a crater-like defect, then in amniotics proteins and the graft. And now when we have a one-wall defect, we can use either graft and the GTR or EMD and graft. So in most cases, we don't need a barrier nowadays. So this is an important message for you. What about some clinical examples? Let me show you a three-wall defect treated with enamimatics proteins and re-entry at one year, which indicates clearly that we have a nice feel. What about a non-contained and a very large defect treated with enamimatics proteins and the graft? And you can observe on the X-ray the very nice feel. So what about furcations? So we recently um, did a systematic review again on the histology, histological outcomes in animals and humans, in furcations. And we can say that in humans, complete regeneration of a class two furcation has only been shown with a combination of a biologic and a graft, which was PDGF and allograft. However, in humans, complete regeneration of class three furcation has not yet been demonstrated. So dear colleagues, class three is a contraindication. And this is one example of one of our studies performed together with Nikos Donos. And you can see uh, class three furcation treated with a flap, indicating that we have still an open environment. But if we are successful in animals, we can close a class three furcation, as you can see it on the slide to the right. However, we have also a very nice paper and an important consensus report from the AP, which has shown and indicated that the application of a combination barrier bone replacement graft with and without biologics may enhance the healing in the best way. So what we recommend nowadays is to use a combination if you want to be successful in a class two furcation. And this is our decision three. Class one, no surgery is needed, scaling and root planning. Class two, we have to evaluate the level of the bony peaks, mesial and distally, to the furcation entrance. If the bony peaks are below, no regenerative surgery is indicated. However, if the bony peaks are coronally 
then we can go into a regenerative approach. And this is always, in our clinic, the combination therapy. However, in class three, is a resective approach or maybe even an uh, extraction. So what about some clinical examples? I give you only one example. You see this very extensive uh, case. The palatal plate is missing. We have a, a class two furcation interproximally. And if we use a combination of autogenous bone in emmetics proteins and the collagen barrier, we found the best outcomes which were stable up to four years. So this is, in fact, our approach. And I can recommend this to you. So what about if we go to soft tissue problems, recessions? And we have some very nice systematic reviews in single recessions. And I can recommend to you the nice paper by Francisco Cairo showing that the best materials until now are the connective tissue graft and in emmetics proteins in conjunction with the coronally advanced flap. However, membranes were not very successful. And for multiple recessions, there are also some nice paper by our group, by Petra Hofmanner, and also by Filippo Graziani. And I would like to show you our decision tree on how can we get from such a situation to such a situation. So let me show you our decision tree. So if I have a Miller class one recession with a thick biotype, the biotype is very important not only the presence of keratinized tissue, but the thickness of the tissue. This is a critical issue. Coronally advanced flap or a coronally advanced tunnel without any graft. So we use only an emmetics proteins in order to enhance also the regeneration. The problem is always when we have a thin biotype, because the patients get recessions because they have thin tissue, not because they have thick tissue. So here, if the flap thickness is less than one millimeter, we need to use a graft. And we either use um, coronally advanced flap or a coronally advanced tunneling flap with a biologic material, or we can use some collagen-derived material. And of course, this is valid for Miller class two and three and one, but Miller class four is not an indication. And I would like to show you some cases. Look at this uh, mandibular case, quite a uh, deep one. So I never do re uh, vertical incisions. We perform a tunneling procedure, connected tissue with an emmetics proteins. The flap is moved coronally. And if you look at the outcomes at two years, you don't see any scar tissue. And I think it's a nice outcome. So we published the first 16 cases. And with this technique is. Um, mean root coverage of 96% in the lower jaw, which is more difficult to treat. And in 12 out of the 16 cases, we found complete root coverage. In multiple recessions, we use the same technique. So we perform a full thickness flap. It's not a split thickness. Then we split the flap, and we move the flap coronally. We use EDTA to condition the root surface and in emmetics proteins. And we also place the graft in an emmetics proteins. And you can see the outcome in this case at 36 months. It's a stable situation, no increased pocket depth. So what about if we look at our data, is 96% complete root coverage. And if we have more extensive defects, like this one in the lower jaw, we perform the tunnel procedure. We don't cut the papillae. But we use connective tissue graft. This is seven centimeters. And we combine it with an emmetics proteins. And this connective tissue is pulled in the tunnel. And then you see that we close the flaps with uh, uh, specific suturing techniques. And this was one single step surgery. And you see the outcome, which is an almost complete coverage in every single recession. So what about if we look at some new developments? Uh, some collagen matrices and combinations. And uh, we have a very nice collaboration with Japan with my friend uh, Dr. Shirakata. And we evaluated for the first time the combination of different types of collagens and in emmetics proteins, because these collagens are very suitable to be used also as a carrier. And this is uh, the matrix that we use, is the mucoderm. And uh, it is one layer. You can pull it very nicely in a tunnel. And the idea was to use also uh, the material as a carrier. And our group, together with uh, Alexandra Steli and Rick Myron, 
Reinhard Gruber, we looked at the different properties of the membranes, the JSON membrane, coral protect, and mucoderm, on how they can be used, in fact, as a carrier for TGF-beta or for an MMX proteins. And the most important findings were that these biologics stick to these, uh, to these membranes, and then they are going to be released very nicely. So this is a very important finding. And then the three membranes have been shown to have a capacity to store and release TGF-beta activity and also to alter gene expression of palatal fibroblasts. And then Yoshi Shirakata did a wonderful study in a chronic recession type model in dogs. So they have used a dogs and they have been treated as follows. They have been treated with a coronally advanced flap, coronally advanced flap in conjunction with an MMX proteins or by using the uh, mucoderm membrane, which is very suitable for this uh, approach, or combining an MMX proteins and the membrane. After 10 weeks, the dogs were killed and the histology was performed. And you can see here the operation. You see it's a chronic defect, it's a gingivitis. This is the defect and this is the technique. So first the material was soaked and then it was applied on the root surface, but also EMD was applied on the root surface and the flaps were closed. And let me show you some of the outcomes. The coronally advanced flap alone resulted only in a reparative type of healing that you can nicely observe here. It's a long junction epithelium and only a very, very minimum formation of new cementum and attachment in the most apical part of the defect. In MMX proteins, this is here at the right, resulted in more cementum and some bone. When we look at the case with the membrane, which you can see at the left, you can see here the root surface. We have a nice apposition of the structures, still some remnants of the membrane, but the cementum formation was more limited. However, if you have a look at the situation at the right, you see plenty of cementum, periodontal ligament, and bone formation indicating a periodontal regeneration. And this was also statistically significant. And let me show you once more, very nice regeneration. You see cementum, periodontal ligament, and bone after the combination therapy. So indicates that this may have also clinical relevance. So we have cases now in the clinic because uh, we tried it in difficult cases. So this is one example, one patient who was uh, treated with this combination. And you see this recession is around seven millimeter of depth. And in these cases, it is very important to increase the tissue thickness, but not only to cover the recession, I don't want to have increased probing depth. I want to have one millimeter of sulcus depth. And this is the outcome in this case using this technique. It's a perfect regeneration of the soft tissues and the probing depth is only one millimeter. So, dear colleagues, I hope that I was able to give you a small overview on uh, that what we are doing now and uh, maybe in the panel discussion we can address some of these issues. Thank you very much for your attention.